So thank you very much for having me here. I'm very excited to do this program for the library. My name is Abby Val Castro. Um, I work at Fairleigh Dickinson University uh, in the social sciences department, um, but my background is actually in writing. I am an adjunct professor of writing, um, and my hobby is uh, working in um, histor the historic field, and I am part of the 2D NJ Brigade, which is the uh, New Jersey's biggest Civil War reenactment group. Um, so we specialize in the Civil War. If you'd like more information about what we do, um, we can definitely talk about that at the end. Uh, and so one of the things that I learned while I was doing the reenacting with the brigade was about this um, group called the Sanitary Commission, which I had never heard of before. Um, and I am a seamstress and a quilter. And when I found that they uh, were using quilts as a way to boost morale, and help the war effort it was like I really need to know more about this so I put this presentation together um, to spread awareness about the sanitary commission and the millions of unnamed women uh, whose uh, contributions to the war effort kind of have gone unnoticed for a really long time um, so we're going to start uh, with talking about why isn't it letting me there we go let's see if I can move this a little bit but all right, so we're going to start about talking about what is the Sanitary Commission, because most people haven't ever heard of it before. Um, and this is a print from Harper's Weekly, which was one of the most prominent magazines during the Civil War period. Um, and I think that this um, woodblock cut really shows you exactly what the Sanitary Commission was doing. Um, and so we can see in the middle image, it is a woman um, looking on and taking care of a sick soldier. Um, so one of the, the main things the Sanitary Commission did was they provided nurses or to do palliative care in the medical hospitals or in the war hospitals uh, for the injured soldiers. You can also see that kind of in these two images up here. This is a nun. Um, and then this is a woman who is uh, probably in what would be called a triage hospital, which would have been on the field or near the field um, administering to the soldier. Um, and then they also were a fundraising group, they, uh, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, so they held these massive bazaars or fairs in which they would uh, raise furnitures in order to supply the army with appropriate supplies. Um, and then the last thing, which is the thing we're going to spend most time talking about, is their, um, their quilting and sewing contributions. So that's just a kind of overview of what the Sanitary Commission was doing during this time. And we'll be unpacking a lot of this as we go through the presentation. So a, a question I often get is why is it called the Sanitary Commission? Because sanitary tends to have a, um, a kind of clinical feel to it, um, you know, where they were like, were they all doctors and nurses and not, not actually no. Um, they provided palliative nursing care, but they were not actually considered to be medical staff. Um, sanitary comes from the sanitation conditions that were going on within the war camps, uh, and they were unsanitary. So you wanted to create a commission that would be able to look at the issues that were happening within the camps, and that's kind of where the name comes from. So a question I often get asked is why the Sanitary Commission was needed. Uh, and it was very, very needed. And this is why. So the picture on the left-hand side is a camp, a soldier's camp. Um, and it's important to note that when we talk about the Sanitary Commission, this was only a Northern Union organization. Um, the Southern contingent did have relief organizations, which we'll talk about a little bit more later, um, but they didn't have anything on the size and scale that the North did. Um, and we'll talk about why that is a little bit later as well. But so why did we need the Sanitary Commission? So if we can look at the picture on the left and see the camp, um, we see the disarray, we see that it's not very orderly. Uh, and camps in general, uh, we have to remember that the average age of a Civil War soldier was between the ages of 15 and 25, um, and that included officers. So you don't really have a lot of kind of older gentlemen uh, presiding over, over the ranks. 
And we live, uh, this is happening within a time period in which men are not really required to know how to cook for themselves. Um, they don't wash their own clothes. They have a wife or a mother or a sister who does that for them. So they're kind of launched into the war um, and they don't know how to cook their own food. They don't know how often to change their socks or wash them because someone's always done that for them. Uh, and in the first six to eight months of the war, many more soldiers die of disease than from actual battle because the camps were just so disgusting. Um, so part of it was the sanitary con conditions or the lack of sanitation con conditions in the camps. The other issue a average soldier faced on both sides was uh, getting appropriate nutritious food. So what we have here in this picture is what an, a daily ration for a soldier and his company. Uh, so a soldier every day was supposed to be given a pork or bacon or salted meat of some kind. Um, once you salt the meat, it does preserve it, but it kind of pulls all the nutritional value out of it. Um, and then they were given bread, flour to make bread, uh, hard bread, which was known as hard tack, uh, or cornmeal, whichever was available. Uh, cornmeal tended to be more for the, the Southern troops, the Confederates. Um, and then for the company, so that was what you got as, as, as one person. And then your company got all of these other things. So you got beans, rice, coffee, sugar, molasses, candles, and soap. But one thing is really missing from this dietary situation, and that are, is anything of nutritional value. Uh, there are no fruits or vegetables. Um, and like I said, as soon as you salt that meat in order to preserve it, um, you pull out any of the nutrition that you should have gotten for it. So really, these guys are running on heavy carbs, sugar, um, and, and not a lot of nutrition. So they suffered from scurvy a lot because they weren't getting enough of the, um, the citrus and the vegetables. Um, and they also had serious issues in the camps with dysentery, which is essentially explosive diarrhea, uh, mostly because if the meat that they got either was not cooked properly because they didn't know how to cook it, uh, or they um, were getting it and it was already bad but they had to eat it anyway. Um, so this was a huge problem and people knew it was happening and they decided we needed to do something about it. The other issue we have is the way the camps were set up as well. Um, so these are some drawings from um, a diary of a Civil War soldier. And you can see the, the kind of the close cramped quarters that they're sleeping in. Um, which in the winter was probably necessary for warmth, um, but it also means the spreading of diseases. Um, personal hygiene wasn't really a big part of the 19th century, um, so you have a lot of bodies squished together that also are not clean. Um, and so things like bed bugs and lice uh, were pretty rampant through the And then we also, which I kind of mentioned before, had these open fires to cook over, um, unless they were going to be entrenched over a long time for the winter, you really wouldn't have set up uh, any kind of hut to have a kitchen in. So when you were on March, you had to eat a bit of fire. You don't know how to cook in that environment. Um, you have some problems. So these are all of the things that the commission uh, is something that was uh, fixed if a and I love a quote by Mary Livermore who was the manager of the northwest part of the sanitary commission out in Chicago um, and this is basically I think like why this kind of mission was necessary uh, so I'm going to read it to you here. It says, women rifled their storerooms and preserved closets of canned fruits and pots of jam and marmalade, which they packed with clothing and blankets, books and stationery, photographs and comfort bags. Baggage cars were soon flooded with fermenting sweetmeats and broken pots of jelly that ought never have to been sent. Delayed trains led to decaying fruit and vegetables, pastry and cake in a demoralized condition, badly canned meats and soups, all of which were necessarily thrown away en route. And with them went the clothing and stationery, 
saturated with the effervescing and putrefying compounds which they unfolded. So I think she's giving us a really visceral understanding here of what was happening um, prior to the Sanitary Commission's takeover. So before we have the Sanitary Commission, there were a lot of these little relief agencies that I mentioned before that kind of like the South had. Um, and they're kind of left over um, from, you know, maybe you were part of a church group that collected uh, donations and things for widows and orphans and orphanages and things like that. And they all kind of pivoted to the war effort after the war started. The problem was, is there was no way for these little organizations to get the supplies where they needed to go. Um, so if there was a railroad explosion, those rail cars full of all of these really important supplies would be stuck and literally would be rotting uh, on the side of the road while they waited to reroute the train supply line to the army, at which point by the time the supplies would get to them, either they would have been thrown out on the way or they were completely destroyed. Uh, which is a waste of everyone's time and money. Uh, and so we need to do something to fix this problem in order to be able to get these supplies where they need to go. So how did it start? Hold on, I have to move this little bar again. All right, so it starts out not as the Sanitary Commission, but as something called the Women's Central Association of Relief, or the WCAR. Um, and it's founded by Elizabeth Blackwell uh, in New York City, and she is the first, considered to be the first female U.S. doctor. Um, she received her MD in 1849. She's one of the first women to do so. Um, I believe her sister also became a doctor a couple of years later, so I think like 1850s. Uh, and the two of them go on to open the first female-only hospital in 1857. So they're, they're trailblazers for their time. Um, really, really important to the medical field. If you want to know more about them, I highly recommend you going and looking up the Sisters Blackwell. Um, but they really understood the importance of sanit sanitization, hygiene, nutrition, all of these things because they were doctors. And they were already part of a relief organization. And Elizabeth in particular felt that like we we can do this, you know, like we can organize. We just have to figure out how and, and what we're going to do. And so she has a, a meeting in New York City. She was a wealthy woman, uh, not just because she was a doctor, but because she came from a wealthy family. And she had a lot of connections with other wealthy people in New York City and in Washington, D.C. Uh, and so she's able to set up a meeting where 4,000 women get together and they decide how they're going to organize. And it's kind of radical what they do. Um, so they set up state chapters that funnel all of these handmade supplies and food and donations um, to a kind of central hub that the central hub is in, con in a collaboration with the army itself. So they know exactly where to send everything. And this, this was huge. Like no one had ever tried to do something on this scale before. Uh, and so here's the mission statement of the, whoops, sorry. The mission, the mission statement of the W car was they were an organization and efficiency to the scattered efforts already in progress. They gathered information on the wants of the army, established relations with the medical staff. They were a depot for hospital stores and they opened a bureau of examination and uh, registration for nursing candidates. So these are those palliative nurses um, that we talked about at the beginning. So this is kind of where it begins. So it was made up of an equal amount of men and women, uh, which for the time period, again, is pretty radical. Uh, women really weren't allowed to sit in positions of power during the Civil War period, uh, but there were women like Dr. Blackwell, who, uh, you know, she was really a pioneer of her time. So uh, the board was made up, as I said, equally of men and women, and it was much larger than these four people, but these were the four most uh, intrinsic people to the process. Uh, again, so we have Dr. Blackwell, she is kind of the founder of this organization. And then on her left is Louisa Lee Schuyler, who is part of the Schuyler family that is um, related to the Hamiltons. I'm not really sure where on the family tree Louisa lives, uh, but she is related to those Schuylers. And she's very young at the time that the war starts. Uh, she's in her late teens, early 20s, and she's really intrinsic um, to getting these little organizations who may or may not trust this kind of 
burgeoning new organization with their supplies because they're spending a lot of time on them. Um, you don't really want to ship them to a hub and then think, you know, well, I don't know where they're going. So Louisa wrote literally thousands of personalized letters to all of these relief organizations uh, explaining what the, the uh, Sanitary Commission was doing, assuaging their fears, and uh, historians believe that these letters are really what made part of what made it so successful and that she was able to convince all of these women that their efforts weren't going to go to waste and the Sanitary Commission was going to take care of their stuff and get it where it was supposed to go. Um, and she was right. Uh, they really did do that. So on the men's side, uh, Dr. Elisha Harris uh, was one of the, the men who went into the camps and um, surveyed the sanitary situation or the lack of sanitary situation. Um, and he came up with kind of a list of check boxes for uh, all camps. So like where your latrine was and how far away it was from your water source, making sure that each of the um, companies had a company cook who knew how to make some simple recipes and the process through which they did that to keep the troops from getting sick. You know, how many times men had to bathe a week, which, you know, for our perspective seems like something you shouldn't have to tell people, uh, but it was a very different kind of time. And lastly is Reverend Henry Bellows. Um, he was very connected in Washington, D.C., and he uh, really sees that this, this organization can be not only helpful, but really nationally important. And so he actually appeals to Lincoln himself, explains what the Sanitary Commission is for, and asks if Lincoln will endorse it. And he does. Uh, Lincoln ratifies the creation of the Sanitary Commission officially on June 13th of 1861, uh, with the caveat that the government would be providing zero funditures for it. They did not have the money. So if this was going to be a civilian run organization, that is who was raising the money. Um, and we'll talk later about how much money they did make. Um, so it is ratified in 1861. And they become officially responsible for the following things. The advisement on the soldiers' physical and mental health, the organization of military hospitals and camps, transporting wounded, distributing medical supplies, food and clothing, and obtaining the private funds to support the organization. They made um, huge hubs or headquarters in all major union cities, so think New York, Philadelphia, and Chicago. Um, this picture is the headquarters in Washington, D.C is the photo in this image. So we're, uh, we are an official organization now and we can really start getting to a place where we're doing a lot of good. Uh, and I love this picture here. I think it, it's a good overview of exactly how organized this group was. And I think it's pretty astounding and amazing that basically within the span of a year, they were able to create this and, and it worked so well. So these tiny dots down here are all of the little relief organizations, you know? So these are your church groups and your sewing clubs and your neighborly get-togethers. Um, these are what all these little dots are. And then what they would do is they would pull all of the things from their group and they would send them to their personal hub. So if, uh, you know, I'll use New Jersey as an example. Um, so, you know, all of the little towns uh, around Somerville, right, would uh, send it to maybe the headquarters in Somerville. And then from there, it would get sent to a major city hub, which would probably be New York City. And from there, it would be sent up to the secretary of whatever the large organization was. So for us, it would be of the East. Um, and they would be in direct contact with the military itself who would say, okay, we're having a battle over here. This is where we're gonna need the supplies. Send me what you have. And then they would have these wagon trains marked US Sanitary Commission that would go to that location, drop the goods at that medical hospital. And that's where, that was how it got where it needed to go. They also had a mail system, which was pretty impressive. So if you wanted to send your loved one at the front a letter, um, you could actually send it through the Sanitary Commission and it would get to them. Uh, they were really, really efficient. Uh, and I, I think in many ways, without the Sanitary Commission, the Union would maybe not have won the war as easily or as quickly <laughs> as they managed to. 
um, because the South really didn't have anything like this uh, because of the uh, way the South was set up. So the Union cities, A are cities, right? And we have the industry on our side um, and we have a much higher population of middle-class people who um, have the time and the money and the, um, the venture, the fortitude to be able to do something like this. Um, in the South, because it was a mostly agrarian caste society, so you have your elite aristocracy on the top, right? They're like the white landowners. Um, they didn't really have a middle class. Underneath them, you had all of your kind of poor white farmers and then the slave population. So you don't have the industry because it's agrarian. Um, you don't really have that middle class who were making up the majority of the women who were in the sanitary commission. And they also were blockaded by the Union. Uh, so getting anything in and out of those ports in any of those southern towns was very, very difficult. Um, so they just didn't have access to the resources that uh, northern women had when they were putting together this kind of organization. Um, so I think it's pretty impressive. Now, they had an enormous financial impact. Uh, in the span of four years, they raised an estimated 25 million in their money. If you uh, adjust for today's inflation, that's over $400 million in four years. So that's $100 million a year that they raised for the war effort. Uh, and one of the ways they did that is by having these huge sanitary fairs or bazaars. So think about like the largest state fair you've ever gone to. Um, and you would pay a cover charge to go in. And then they had these lines and lines and lines of booths um, that were filled with all of these handcrafts and fabric and jellies and jams and all kinds of different things that you could buy. And all of the proceeds from these fairs went right back into the sanitary commission so that they could buy medicine, bandages, food supplies, et cetera, and ship them to the front. Um, so the financial impact is absolutely huge, and many historians believe that this is part of why the Union was able to win. Um, not only were they financially backed by a civilian group at this magnitude, the government did not have this kind of money, um, but they were also being, the troops were being supplied with a, a level of nutrition and care and comfort that the Southern soldiers weren't getting, uh, which leads to our, our next impact, which is morale. Now, there's no way to quantify the morale impact of the Sanitary Commission because that's just not something that we can get data on. Um, but the fact that the Union was able to win, I think, goes a long way to saying kind of what the morale is, um, as well as a lot of the letters that got sent back and forth, both through the Sanitary Commission, as you can see right here, um, but also in diary entries and other firsthand accounts of soldiers of the time. Anytime the U.S. Sanitary Commission was coming in, um, they were always seen uh, as a welcome site. And uh, particularly in hospital settings, they were able to supply the Union troops with the uh, kind of medical care that the Southern troops were not able to get simply because um, they just didn't have the resources. So. From a morale standpoint for the troops, it was probably really high. Um, I also think that if we're talking about the civilian population, there's something to be said for feeling like you're doing something. You know, the war was a, a hopeless thing. People were, you know, men obviously were dying every day. There were lists that would get sent to your town saying who in your town had died on the front. Um, so it was really an abysmal time for most people, even if you weren't actively fighting. Um, and I think for a lot of Northern women, this gave them something to hope for, and it made them feel like they were part of something, that they were doing something to help their father, son, brother, husband uh, in the field, even if it wasn't going directly to him, it was going to, to the effort. Um, and I think that was a, a morale boost as well. Uh, and I know in the South that uh, it was devastating. Um, they didn't have good morale down there because there was no way for you to get your troops something. So I think morale is a huge part of the impact the Sanitary Commission has uh, in this time period. So let's talk specifically about quilts, because uh, that's kind of the thing the Sanitary Commission is most known for is kind of the sanitary quilt. 
Um, and I know we have some crafters in the audience, uh, so the rest of the presentation will be focused on the quilts of this particular organization. Uh, and I think when we talk about quilts as as a form of comfort, I mean, there's nothing I think is more quintessentially comforting than a blanket, right? If you're homesick, the first thing you do is crawl under a blanket, right? So there's something about receiving a blanket um, that I think has a, a kind of comfort impact. Uh, and I love this quote from a Mrs. Hook in 1863, uh, and she's talking about working with the Sanitary Commission. So I'll read you the quote here. It says, women have given their husbands, their sons. This passion not content with giving up the breadwinners has led the women of the land to take the snowy quilts and blankets from their beds, the curtains from their windows, the hoarded linen from their presses, and send it in avalanches of comfort to our storehouses of relief. Again, she's painting a really visceral picture of how women felt about giving these blankets and how they were received. Um, it is estimated that they made between 250,000 and 400,000 quilts for the Union Army. Um, there's no way to know exactly how many because they were used and abused and, you know, taken out, thrown away, um, left in fields. Uh, but this is the estimate. So it, it is an, an enormous number. And when you think about it, the time period, we do have sewing machines, um, but quilts were still predominantly made by hand in this period. So think about 400,000 quilts, the amount of hours it takes to hand stitch a quilt. Um, you're talking thousands and thousands of hours over these four years of, of churning these kinds of blankets out. Now, there is kind of this misnomer that people think the blankets were getting sent to like to the battle area, and that's not true. 99% uh, of the quilts were sent to hospitals. Uh, and so they were made in what was called regulation size, which would have fit a hospital cot. If you want to make your own, it's 48 inches by 84 is the size of the quilt. Um, if you find any sanitary coordination quilts that are not that size, oftentimes th they were made to auction off at the sanitary fairs in order to raise money for more supplies, which we will be looking at one of those. Um, so how do we know if it's a sanitary commission quilt or if it went through the that organizational process? They all have this stamp. So if you're antiquing, and you happen to come across a textile that has this stamp on it, it means it meant through the sanitary commission process in order to get where it needed to go. Uh, and so this quilt is a regulation sized hospital quilt um, and it is stamped on the back with sanitary commission. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about how a quilt is made just to give us a sense of what, what we're looking at. Um, and quilts is a bit of a misnomer. We call lots of different kinds of blankets quilts, uh, but quilting refers to the actual act of top stitching layers of fabric together. Um, so if you have a blanket that has several layers to it, but it has not actually been top stitched, it's not a quilt, it's just a blanket. Uh, so that's, that's the difference. So the quilting, this is what top stitching looks like. Uh, and that's what makes it a quilt versus a blanket. And the quilt is made from three different layers. So you have your backing, which is normally a, a can be a solid piece, the uh, cotton batting, which is what gives it its warmth, and then your quilt topper. And that's usually the part we think about as the quilt when we look at a quilt. Um, the topper is usually the pattern. So it has the block and the pattern, whatever. Um, and then this is the hand stitching of the quilt. So you can see the three layers here together. Uh, and then there, the woman is top stitching it, and that's what creates a quilt. So that's that's the kind of blanket we're talking about as we go forward. So we're going to look at some existing examples in museum collections. Um, I tried to find ones that were on display all the time, so that if you happen to want to go and see them, you can. Um, the first one we're going to look at is a Sanitary Commission Fair fundraiser piece. Um, it is called the Album Quilt from 1864. And the Album Quilt always has this white square in the middle. And that white square is where you would write your name. That's why it's called an Album Quilt. A lot of people in the 1860s would use it as a family tree um, or a friend circle. Uh, for this one, um, the women who made it uh, got a bunch of famous people to sign it in order to auction it off for a higher rate at the sanitary fair. 
Um, so this one contains 56 signatures, um, including Abraham Lincoln and General George McClellan, as well as many other senators and um, po uh, politicians from the 1860s. I don't know how much it got sold off for <laughs> at the uh, sanitary fair, but it is made of silk, um, which is not something that quilts are normally made from. Um, so this would mean this would have been a very expensive piece. And we can see from the braiding, um, it's possible you could have put this on a bed, but my guess would be that you would have used this more as a display piece in your home. Um, it is located at Ford's Theater in Washington, DC. So if you would like to go see it, it is on display there and you can actually look at all of the, um, the signatures on the quilt there. All right, our next one is made by a Sunday school class. Uh, this one is called the Susanna Pullen Quilt. She was the Sunday school teacher and her class made this in 1863. Um, it is housed in the National Museum of American History. Not sure if it's on display or not, uh, but it is in their, in their collection. And it's a regulation hospital size. So we know that this probably went to a hospital. Um, and we also know it was donated to the Sanitary Commission because it has a stamp on the back. Each triangle, so that's these little shapes here, all have either a Bible verse or a personal message um, that the Sunday school girls left on the, the quilt for whoever would receive this uh, to help boost their morale as they were getting better. And I don't know if you can really see it in this picture, but um, this is a, a, a kind of enhanced view so that you can see the writing on the block. Um, and I think this this is really cool because this is called a, um, a pot holder quilt. So basically each of the girls took one of these squares home with them, finished it, quilted it, bound the edges so that it was a complete piece. And then they all came back together and they sewed all the little pieces together to actually make it into the quilt. Um, so each piece is completely individual to whoever the person was who made it. Um, and in a, a little while, I'll show you a different view of this quilt from the back, and you'll be able to see how the pattern of each quilt is different. Each block is different. All right, this one was made by one person. Um, this is an applique quilt from 1861. It was made by Mary Rockhold Teeter. Uh, it is also in the National Museum of American History. Again, not sure if it's on display, but it's in their collection. Um, and it was made in Indiana. It's made of cotton and applique is um, when you cut a shape out and you actually adhere it to the top of the quilt. Um, so she cut each of those little individual stars and then she applique them or hand stitched them onto the quilt. And she made this specifically for her son, George Teeter. Uh, he was an infantryman. And the 34 stars represent the 34 states that were in the Union in 1861. She based this off of a pattern in a women's magazine called Peterson's that was really popular in the 19th century. So think about it like a good housekeeping magazine. Um, and so this is where she got it. It's not clear if this went through the Sanitary Commission or not. It doesn't have a stamp on it, so probably not. Um, she may have just made it, and if he was home on leave, she could have given it to him, and he would have taken it with him to the front. All right, this one is one of my favorite quilts uh, because it has a really cool story behind it. Um, it is a, just called the Sanitary Commission quilt. It has the stamp, so we know it went through the process. It was made in 1863 uh, by several women from Vernon, Connecticut. Not sure who they were. Um, but they did sign, so you can see uh, in the little white centers here, there's writing. Um, so all of the ladies who worked on this quilt signed the quilt, and one lady in particular actually wrote a letter that she folded up into the quilt. Um, and it ended up with a man named Captain Robert Emmett Fisk. He was in the 132nd New York Infantry. He was in the hospital. He received this quilt, opened it up. There was a letter in there. He answered the letter and through this correspondence ended up falling in love with the sewer's sister uh, and the two of them ended up getting married after the war was over. So uh, going back to that morale, uh, so I had to be pretty a, a pretty big morale boost to open your handmade quilt, find all these beautiful messages written on the quilt and then find a letter inside. 
uh, that he answered and got a response from. Uh, so that was a happy ending for this quilt. Um, and it's one of my favorites because I love to tell that story. This one is at the Lincoln Memorial Shrine in California. Uh, and this one is on display if you wanted to go and see it in person. This one is uh, also made by one person. Uh, this was called the Carolina Bowen Fairbax quilt. She made it in 1863 for her husband after they got married. Um, he was on leave at home. And so this one did, uh, interestingly, even though he was at home, I guess she hadn't finished it before he had to go back to the front um, because it is stamped not only with the Sanitary Commission's logo, but also the Brandon Soldiers Aid Society, which was probably what her local society was called. Uh, so I find that really interesting that, you know, she sent it to a specific person and it did get to him uh, it, sending it through this system. Uh, so I think that just goes to show how efficient it was. Uh, and uh, she also inked this quilt. So she wrote her husband Bible verses and other religious sayings in each of these empty squares. Again, a morale boost that he could read them and know that while he was away, she was thinking about him. All right, so I told you I would show you the back of that um, that Sunday school quilt. And so here's the back. This is how we know it's a pot holder quilt. So if it was made by one person or it was a quilt that a lot of people were working on at the same time, um, this backer would all be one piece of cloth. So we know it's a pot holder quilt because each one is different. Um, and I don't know if you can really see from your angle on the computer, but the patterns of quilting are very different in each one. Um, and I think that just gives another level to the, the attention to detail and the handcraft that went into making these quilts. Uh, and again, they made thousands, literally thousands of these. So the attention to detail and the time, I think really shows the level of care that the women of the Sanitary Commission had in making these items to send to the front. Here's another one I really like, um, and I particularly like it because I think it also shows that no matter where in society you were in the North, uh, everyone was trying to be a part of this, uh, this organization. So this is the front of the quilt. So we have all the different kinds of quilt blocks. Um, so like this is called a four patch. Um, this is a checkerboard. I don't even know the names of all of them, but this is a pinwheel. So um, this is a half square triangle block. Um, this one's called the cross block. So there are all these different kinds of blocks that you could make. And um, even for the backs, you know, I think it really shows that people used whatever they had. I mean, this one, it looks like it's literally just pieced out of scrap, um, but they were, they were emptying their stores. They were, no matter how much money you did or did not have, everybody wanted to be involved with this. And maybe you could only make a couple of squares, um, but those all went to good use and these all ended up going to the front to be helpful. All right, so if you would like to learn more about quilting in general, if you're interested in trying to quilt or wanting to learn more about quilting, um, the Missouri Star Quilt Company is uh, one of my highly recommended places to start. They have a whole YouTube channel on um, easy patterns and pre-cuts. Um, so if you've never quilted before and it's a little intimidating, uh, Missouri Star would probably be a great place to start. If you're more on the advanced side and you're looking for like fun stuff, um, there is an amazing quilt artist named Rob Apel, uh, and he has some really cool tutorials. So that's more for advanced people. Uh, and then if you're in New Jersey, uh, the Stitch Adventure Shop in Newton, New Jersey um, is a wonderful place. They have classes there. You can learn how to work the huge long arm to actually quilt your quilt with the digital process. Um, and they have a, a huge selection of fabric as well. So if you want to support local, it's a great place to do that. If you're interested in the history, you want to know more about the Sanitary Commission and civilians in the Civil War. Um, these are some of the um, resources I used for this presentation. I really love the Essential Civil War curriculum. I get a lot of great stuff from them. The Civil War Sisterhood was a little academic, um, but really good information. And uh, my favorite book, I can't recommend it enough, is The Colors of Courage by Margaret Crichton. It is specifically about Gettysburg. It doesn't really have a lot to do with the Sanitary Commission per se, but it is a really fantastic overview of civilian experience 
during uh, one of the worst battles of the war, uh, both for women, immigrants, and the African-American population. Um, so highly recommend it. 